data has to be a living, breathing kind of organism. And when you have that mindset, you don't really think of data as done. Data's never finished. Platforms are never POA. They're never point of arrival because there's always something else coming. And as long as you have that data mindset and data as a product, we're keeping pace with the evolving technology and making sure that we're headed in that direction wherever that may go. Today it's cloud, but five years from now, I, I bet you it's going to be something else and we just have to be ready for it. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Data is never done. As Pascal Hutz, the Chief Data Officer and EVP of Enterprise Digital and Data Solutions at American Express puts it, it's a living, breathing organism that should be managed as a product. Throughout her 30-year career at American Express, Hutz has been on the forefront of many large-scale infrastructure changes, and she credits this mindset for her ability to keep pace with evolving technology, making sure her organization is headed in the right direction, wherever that may be. Tune in to hear more about her latest cloud migration journey, why she's on a mission to decommission, and how she fights imposter syndrome even as a C-level executive in one of the largest, most impactful financial services firms in the world. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people at companies like Verizon, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Frontify, Hari, and Workato use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Pascal, welcome to the Data Chief. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks for having me. Where are you joining us from today, Pascal? So today I'm in the office. You can tell from my background. Um, I'm joining you from Lower Manhattan, uh, right across from Statue of Liberty in uh, the World Financial Center. Oh, beautiful. So almost in my backyard. Now, Pascal, I think I have been an American Express card holder for as long as you have worked there. Nice. Well, we <laughs> love that. Thank you for your membership. That's amazing. Yes. We love well, the I, stories. <laughs> I think it's also amazing. We think of the average tenure of a chief data officer as being 2.4 years, according to Randy Bean, <laughs> author of Fail Fast, Learn Faster. But yes. I actually think it's shortened in the pandemic. And yet you have had this illustrious career for about 27 years now at American Express. I have, but you know, um, I didn't do it all as a chief data officer. So from that perspective, I'm a year in and my goal is to surpass 2.4 <laughs> years as a chief data officer. So I've got another year and four months to go, I think. Okay. Um, so wish me luck. <laughs> We will wish you luck. Now, tell us Excellent. a little bit about how you started in the data space. And I do think it's important to go back to the beginning. Your background in college is very relevant and slightly different. So tell us about that. Sure. Um, you know, as I was reflecting on that, um, I've always loved math and I've always been a big math nerd my whole family is a long line of math geeks. So it should have been no surprise that when I went to college, uh, I ended up, um, you know, falling into like a math track. Uh, and it's actually kind of amusing. I switched majors about three times. And I kept loving the statistics classes. I did psychology, but I only liked the stats class. I did economics, but I only liked the stats class. So it took me a while to realize um, I really just like math. And so um, I ended up doing uh, math and economics and then majored in statistics in college. Okay, and who knew back then that it would be such a winning combination because you can have the statistics, but if you don't understand the psychology of why people may or may not act on a particular data point, then it's not as useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was a good combination, but I ended up actually doing mainly math and uh, economics. But I think my journey through all of those different um, 
degrees was kind of our majors was was an interesting path for me to learn how math is actually used in real life. And so it was very helpful, I thought, um, yeah. to go that way. Yeah, well, clearly you've proven it. So then you began at American <laughs> Express in their risk management, a, an ideal place to apply yeah. the statistical background. So tell us a little bit about that chapter. Yeah, so, um, you know, with statistics as a major, I had really had two two options at the time in the mid 90s. It was either um, financial services or pharmaceuticals. So I thought, you know what, um, I had an offer from American Express and I was like, that sounds like a great place. I'll go there and I'll just stay two years and then I'll move around and do something else. <laughs> uh, 27 years later, I'm still here. So uh, I think it worked out. It, clearly, but you have moved around a fair bit in American Express, giving you a view into all the operations and how it ultimately touches the lives of people like me, a customer or a, a card member. Um, so now with your role as the CDO, what is, what is the role of data in servicing customers? Yeah, so, you know, I spent my first 16 years in risk management, um, which was a really great, a great place to hone in, you know, with my statistics background, very easy fit. And then about 16 years into that, I had this opportunity to move into our operations team, which is running our call centers globally, you know, our, across the world, um, all of the regions. And there you get the opportunity to really see data in action. And I got to work very closely with our call center employees. And there you really get the voice of the customer. And you see how data, how that helps us with our customer service and you know, customer service at the heart of the American Express brand. And the power behind great customer service is actually the data. So it, it was a really, um, I thought, good move in my career to go in that direction and really apply the math um, in a very direct way to uh, impact customers. Right. So if I picture the call center operations and <laughs> Pascal, I was saying when we first met you and we were doing a prep call, I'm like, I never pay my bills late, but just imagine that I have a missed payment. Well, guess what? I was traveling last week and uh, we were late. We were late with our bill. So now if I'm calling the contact center or maybe using a, a chat bot or email, take us, take us through what happens. Um, how do you, what do you know about me and how do you use that to handle this late payment? Yeah, so let me bring that to life for you a little bit. Um, so, you know, we all miss payments. It happens, as you can attest to. What would happen is, right, like we would um, we would note that our data repositories will say, hey, Cindy forgot to pay her bill this month. What should happen, uh, what would happen is likely we would analyze, you know, your payment behavior and we would see, you know, Cindy never really misses her bill. Like that hasn't happened in the X number of years that we're gonna go back. Um, and we would say that's probably just an aberration. Maybe she was traveling. Um, if you're using your credit card, uh, we would be able to tell that you were indeed traveling. Um, and that might be the reason that you've missed your bill. So ideally, we would probably send you a push notification or an email saying, hey, Cindy, FYI, Reminder, you forgot to pay your bill. Can we help you with that? Um, alternatively, if you are panicked and you call the call centers, uh, the good news is our customer service agents would have all that information available at their fingertips and be able to tell you, it's okay. We know we know that you this is an aberration for you. You never really miss your bill. And can we help you take that payment for you over the phone? Or can we direct you to any of our digital channels? Um, and it's all that data that stitches that together and makes that experience happen for you. Yeah, so I actually did get the email, <laughs> which is the only reason I knew I, I missed it. I was like, what? Oh my gosh, I don't even have the bill. Um, so it, yeah, 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 it was, <laughs> so that part worked. You'll be glad to know. 
Um, now, yes. cus customer data, though, is often highly fragmented. So if you think about the need for this customer 360, you're contacting me, I'm calling you, you're processing payments, there's the customer view, there's the merchant view as well. Where is Cindy? Where is she mm -hmm. traveling and shopping? I was actually in Las Vegas last week. How do you bring that all together? Yeah, so that's a really great question. We do have an enormous amount of data. So, you know, you have to remember American Express is, is a payments provider like a Chase or a City, but we're also the, the network and we're the merchant acquirer. So we know where you're transacting in amazing amounts of detail. So we have this wealth of information, which sometimes can be a bit, you know, you could almost think of it as a burden, but it really isn't. It's, it's an amazing asset. Um, so the magic behind that is stitching all the data together, right? Like that's really the magic of sifting through all of that pulling in your, your customer behavior, where you've been, and at that moment that you're calling in, being able to synthesize all of those events to kind of predict why you're calling and be ready with information to help you solve your problems. So there is behind the scenes a lot of stitching of relevant data together in order for that email to go out, as an example, or the push notification to go out. We do a lot of our data scientists here, that's what they spend their time doing, is figuring out how to use the data to affect that customer experience. Yeah, so with that volume of data, American Express was early to, let's say, um, big data platforms, but the technology and state yes. of the art continues to change. So how do you continue to leverage what was already in place, but also rewire and move to the cloud for better scale, better personalization? So that's a, also a really great question. So as you can imagine, um, as you stated, American Express was early on in its big data journey. We were one of the first to really jump into that ecosystem. Um, and I happy to say that, you know, very proud we have some of the, the just the best data scientists in their field are at American Express. Um, likewise, you know, we've been also very early on in adopting cloud. Like that is the, obviously the next logical evolution for data. It gives us that computing power that we need and will really power all of those experiences and synthesizing the data quicker, faster, better. So we, we're actively moving to it. Um, well, we have cloud, but we're, we're expanding into that space. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we talked about in our, in our prep call was managing data as a product. Like data has to be a living, breathing kind of organism. And when you have that mindset, you don't really think of data as done. Data's never finished. Platforms are... Um, Platforms are never POA, they're never point of arrival because there's always something else coming. And as long as you have that data mindset and the product data as a product, we're keeping pace with the evolving technology and making sure that we're headed in that direction where, wherever that may go. You know, today it's cloud, but five years from now, I, I bet you it's gonna be something else and we just have to get ready, be ready for it. And I, yeah. I think the way that we approach data is going to help. Yeah, so there's a couple things there I want to parse. So data as a product, this is also a term that um, Jamak Dagani will use in the data mesh or, da or data products. So was this a thinking that you had adopted before some of these principles came out? Or... Um, is it informed by some of the new concepts like data fabrics and data meshes? I have to say, for me, it's a recent evolution in my thinking. And I think it's a recent evolution in how American Express also has been um, thinking about data and data platforms. For me personally, 
having been in risk management, data was, you know, the heart of the tools of what we were doing. We're, we're creating policy and, and procedures based on data analysis. In operations, we're leveraging data, like the experience that I described to you is all powered by data. But it wasn't really till I took this role as chief data officer about a year ago and assumed responsibilities for data platforms that it really began to shift my thinking of data as a product and the platforms never really being at POA and kind of <clears throat> removing that from like your solution set. Like it's, it's, I often get asked, well, when will we be done with this data migration? And I'm like, we're never really done. It's, it's, and we shouldn't look at it as, as, <clears throat> as a failure or anything like that, it's just an evolving system that will keep growing and changing and transforming. But for me personally, I really came to that realization probably about a year ago. Happily, our technology group has been in that mind space for a few years longer than me. Um, so we're in a really good space. Okay, so that's good. So it sounds like you're thinking about the technology is the how, whether it's on-premises, uh, big data lake or cloud, and the data is a product sits sits above that. Um, if yeah. if you think of one data product, give give me an example of how that plays out. Like, is it customer data? Is it payment data? G give me or or maybe even um, you know services because American Express also does travel services. So give me an example of how that plays out. Well, so I think of it, the way that it comes to me really in real life is, um, you know, we currently have several uh, data platforms that are in various stages of evolution. We have, <coughs> excuse me, we have probably our oldest platform, which is probably 15, 20 years old, has a little bit of data left on it, and we're actively migrating it to what was a, a more robust platform um, from a few years ago, but now we have this opportunity to, to merge and go into public cloud type of environment. And so I view like this sort of in three phases of you have like an existing platform that is your current best practice, you're actively moving data into it, but there's always gonna be that next big thing and we should always think about having a space in for that third, that third evolution. And so there's, to me, there's always three and, and you're, mon you're migrating through that journey. Um, and then when, you know, cloud will be, will be the POA and then we'll move off that old platform and then there'll be something else and it's okay. And we're on this like lazy river kind of continuously moving and evolving. And, and that's the way I think about data as a product. So the past, the present, and the future. And you used- In the future, yeah. <laughs> well, you used an analogy of a lazy river. Um, I think of it as more like white water rapids and what the heck is around that bend? <laughs> and did we flip over as we did this migration? Um, I don't know. Is this your demeanor that you're more calm and things are a little more chaotic in my world? Yeah, no, I mean, I've in my career, I've always been um, at the forefront of like large infrastructure changes. And to me, it, you can, just can't be too wound up about it. Things will go wrong. It's OK. So to me, it's it's more healthy, more Zen to view it as a lazy river, even though sometimes it does feel like whitewater rafting. It is more zen. <laughs> it is more zen. <laughs> so if you think to the future, one of the trends that people will talk about is data at the edge. Is this something you believe is nearer term or what are your thoughts on this? So I haven't heard that concept. Talk to me a little bit more about, about that. What does that relate to? Actually having them maybe in devices. So maybe it's data in the actual oh. physical card or data in our right. phones and you're leveraging that rather than all this, you know, bring it all into one place in a cloud data store. It's actually in both places. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I've, re- I've heard that referred to as a data fog, which I love that analogy. I think it's so interesting. I, d- I think that will be like that. That's going to be the future future, right? Once we're done with cloud, that'll be the thing is how do you consume that data and make it relevant? And at American Express, how do we make that relevant for the customer experience? You can think of data from our lounges that'll just be like that, you know, it'll just be stored there. Like, how do we use that? What, how, what is the most powerful way to use that information? And then we'll have to think of how to consume it. And, you know, back to your earlier question about how do you stitch it all together? That'll be, I think, the important, the important learning as we figure out how to, how to work it and stitch it with our data that's at rest or our data that is in the cloud. How do we bring it together? to have the best customer experience. So I don't know, that'll be that'll be our future state. We'll have to, I'll let you know in a year and a half okay, or so. Yeah. How about oh, that? in a year and a half, it's, that's back. pretty quick. Yeah, that's pretty quick. Well, hopefully it's not yeah. too foggy. Um, you, <laughs> Pascal, you shared an article with an interview um, with uh, Pervy Shaw, your vice president of enterprise data platforms, and she used this term that I quite liked, a mission to decommission. So this is your past. Um, And I would say, as an industry, we do not do a good job at decommissioning. We like things to die a slow death, or we don't even know who's (laughs) using something, and so we're scared of shutting things down. How do you view this at American Express? Yeah, I I love that mission to decommission. Um, In a prior role, we we had a project called Creative Destruction that kind of gets to that as well. Um, You know, I think American Express, like any large organization, we're learning our way through that. But I do think there's something um, inherent in this industry of not really wanting to turn things off because you want to work on the fun, sexy things. You don't really spend time decommissioning that past. Um, so, but we have to get into that, that mindset of decommissioning the past makes way for the future. It makes room um, because it, you know, when you leave these legacy systems like lying around, somebody's maintaining them or worse yet, somebody's not maintaining them and then there's bad things are happening. So it is a, it is a discipline we have to force ourselves into but I, I think it will yield benefits. And we're trying to make it fun, like you know, calling it our mission to decommission and, and rewarding all of those people that are working on it. And they're not working on the cool, sexy thing, but we could say this is equally as important and we have to reward and recognize the people that are doing that hard work. Yeah, you're right. I do think that it is people want to work on the fun things. And so you, yes. you do, most often you don't celebrate the people that are doing the hard work of decommissioning. Can you share some specifics of how you reward those people? Well, you know, a great example is working with Pervy and her team. They are are currently working on decommissioning that past segment um, of our data infrastructure. And we've made it a top initiative of the company. It gets a lot of recognition. Um, That project has been presented to our CEO several times. You know, that's the type of recognition that really resonates with people to make it something that they would want to work on. And it's a great opportunity for Purvi to have that that forum. So that's just one easy, I say easy, but it's one way to make it really um, impactful for the people working on it. Yeah, executive exposure that is high profile. Yeah, um, yeah. It, so, so celebrating that I think is huge. Do it? Do you think this also ties into skills? Like, do you paint a picture for if they work on this decommissioning, what will be their career progression? What comes next? Uh, I do think because these things tend tend to be probably more impactful than you think they are. Having that under your belt as something you can say, hey, I worked on this is impactful itself. 
The other thing that um, I don't think people take into account enough is there's an awful lot of innovation that is required sometimes to turn these systems off because they're interconnected in ways that people forgot about. And so you have to really, you have to like shape the program such that you're unplugging things. And ironically, Pervy's project is called Project Unplug. <laughs> um, we're unplugging things and you need, you need to not break anything, like do no harm. And so now you need to rewire the modern system in a way that allows for the no harm to occur. So there's an, there can be an awful lot of innovation also. Um, I usually enjoy those projects where it looks impossible, but you, to me, you can't, you can't tell me something's impossible. It's always possible. So those projects sometimes afford you more innovation than even the newer modern ones. Mm, mm, interesting, so I think yeah. There's a, I, I recommend working on those to anybody. I, I think they're great. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a view at, at ThoughtSpot informed by this author and entrepreneur, Mick Ebeling. Not impossible. It, things that just because you're doing it the first time doesn't mean it's not impossible. Commit, then figure it out. Exactly. So, There's always a way. Yeah, so it sounds like as well as in many CDO roles, there's a lot of collaboration that you are responsible for with the, with the COO as well as your CTO. Where within the organization does your role sit? So my role reports into um, our CEO of the bank, uh, Honoré Williams. He has the technology organization, my organization, our call center or operations organization, um, as well as responsibility for the bank. So I sit um, on his direct report team and our chief technology officer is a peer. So that's how we, we're on equal footing reporting into him. Okay, so it's really at the intersection of technology, business operations, and yes. data. Has this been a difficult transition to navigate given that you've only been in this role for a year or was the culture and the collaboration, the swim lanes already clear? So I will say, um, I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration uh, at any large organization, but it's, it's really a key hallmark within American Express, we do many things in a very collaborative environment. We're not very particularly siloed. Um, and, it, and specifically in the organization that I'm in, this organization was formed a year ago when I took this role and bringing technology, data, operations in the bank closer together enabled us to do, um, to do more data rich activities as we're, we're all you know, uh, we all have the same goals and the same um, the same items to achieve by the end of the year. And it brought it brought me a lot closer to my technology organization. So that was great. I think it was a, a good way to pull in the synergies across the teams and affect some of the um, some of the experiences that we talked about earlier as it relates to customer service, because they're also like our sister group. So. We're all very tight and work on many things together. Okay, and so that's part one to the answer. Was there a second part to that? <laughs> um, from which perspective? Oh, I thought you said you were gonna answer in two, two parts. But oh, okay, I guess otherwise I don't worry about part. it. Right. <laughs> all right, we'll edit it's that, okay. we'll edit that part out. Um, okay. So, and Pascal, you, so you've been in this role now for a year and I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember, I think you said you almost didn't apply for it, or was that a, an earlier role? You almost didn't go down this path. Uh, that was, yeah, that was my operations role um, that I had been in, in risk management for, for 16 years. And uh, the role we talked about was the operations role that um, I nearly didn't take. Okay, why not? Um, so, you know, it may seem unusual, but um, 
I do suffer a bit from imposter syndrome uh, periodically, and uh, this great opportunity came up at the time. And um, there were two people that were being considered for it, myself and and a peer. And I, you know, Cindy, I thought for sure I was never going to get that job. I was like, why, why, you know, they, why would they pick me? Like, I, I didn't think I was, I was qualified. Um, and I'll let you know between between me and my peer, um, I was the one that had, you know, 16 years of long history working very collaboratively with our operations team. Um, and he was in a different uh, part of the organization uh, in risk management as well, but working with marketing. And uh, we were talking about the role. And I said, you know, are you going to go for the role? He's like, of course. I'm like, well, what he's I said, what, what, what makes you think you can do the role? He said, well, why can't I do the role? Why wouldn't I be able to do the role? And I was like, well, how come I don't have that perspective? Why? Why do I doubt myself? And I was like, well, I should I have way more experience than he does working for operations. And it, it really shifted the way that I thought about um, my contributions. And um, I ended up getting the role. So I guess I was I wasn't too far off in my thinking. <laughs> yeah. So it put you on on the path to the CDO. But it's interesting, Pascal, I'm sure many listeners are thinking, wait a minute, she's she's a C-level executive in one of the largest, most impactful financial services firms in the world. And yet you have imposter syndrome. If you have it, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, how does how does anyone get through this? So in that moment, was it you just recognizing that your experience was better than the next candidate? Or is this something that you continue to have to mentally coach yourself about? I think it's a little bit of both. It was it was a really um, it was a really pivotal moment, and I, I to this day, even though it was like eleven years ago, I still remember that conversation uh, with my peer. And I remember thinking that I am evaluating my skills completely incorrectly. Like he was looking at a at it at a broader level and thinking about how could his skills apply to this role. And I was thinking about it, how could my skills not apply to this role? So it was a really big shift for me. Um, and I do think now having had that experience, I think about it all the time because some, you know, the imposter thing comes up periodically. And I think I'm like, no, 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 let me take a step back. Are these doubts that I'm having real doubts um, or is it just insecurity? And then I, I, I kind of check myself. I have yeah. to keep reminding myself, but but it's it's a good wake up call. Yeah, and my CEO recently shared with me that seemingly there's a high correlation between EQ and imposter syndrome, which I was really disappointed about that because <laughs> we all want leaders with higher EQ, and I think I've, I, I have high EQ, but I don't want the imposter syndrome side of it. Do you agree with this, or um, is this something you've noticed? I I do think so. The I, I think once you mentioned that um, earlier to me, I thought, wow, that is really profound. The, the other thing that I had uh, read somewhere is uh, people with a uh, higher level of anxiety or that doubt themselves are often people that um, very critically analyze every situation. Uh, and I, I find myself that I am one of those people. Um, and and it's a and the point of the article was that that is not necessarily a bad thing because you're always on the lookout for those unspoken subtle cues and you you're more observant and you find more connections. Um, than other people may. So it's sort of turning that thing that you think is is an impediment into a superpower. And that's kind of how I think about it. So I love that. I think we yeah. should just catch ourselves out saying, hey, no, no, it's just because you have a high EQ that you're, doubt you're doubting yourself. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, I like turning it into a superpower. One of my bosses early on, uh, um, who later became the CIO at Dow Chemical, he we were working on a very tough project. And he said, if you can't do it, who can? And I think that's another <laughs> positive way of phrasing something rather than thinking of all the reasons you can't or shouldn't or that it would be hard. 
Um, well, Pascal, you sh you've shared a little bit about your journey, a little bit about um, your your background coming up in American Express. The other thing is our space, you started in statistics and now more mm -hmm. squarely in data. As a woman in tech, how do you uh, approach bringing more women into this space? Um, you know, so I firmly believe, you know, women beget more women. And I think as, as we, Thankfully, um, uh, women coming up in the data and tech space, uh, it's a different environment than, than when I started. Uh, way back in grad school, you know, you'd often be the only woman in a class or a very few of you. And I think things have changed a lot. Uh, and I, I, what I love about data is it's very transparent and you, you can really understand what's going on in your, your industry or in your domain when you look at the data. And I think if you're a woman and you have a passion for data, it's a great, a great field to go into. Um, and I actually took this role at American Express way back in the day because the group was headed by a woman. And I was like, that's amazing. I wanna, I wanna join that firm. So we need to bring more women in so that, you know, we you just wanna have that diversity of opinions. You don't want, you know, the same the same viewpoints, and I think having more gender diversity affords you that, along with all other kinds of diversity. But it, it's definitely an important component. Yeah, that diversity of thought. So, do you think it's getting better as you recruit new members for your team? Yes. The argument has been we have both a pipeline problem and a leaky pipeline, and that leaky pipeline took a, a setback in the pandemic. What are you seeing as you recruit so, talent in your team? In my, I have to say, and maybe we're just very lucky, or maybe we have the women beget more women. Uh, we have not had a challenge uh, recruiting uh, women into our organization. So I think I'm very lucky. But again, I think it's you have a we have a really good balance of the hiring leaders and the VPs and the SVPs of the team being women and i think women look up to that and see hey well that's a that's a place i can thrive um i will say the the same thing is true though that leaky pipeline we've lost a lot of uh good talent as all companies have in this uh in this pandemic uh, but we're still in a really really good spot um and our recruiting efforts are bringing in you know as many more women so i think it's great good. i think we're in a good spot Good. All right, Pascal, let's switch to some lightning rounds. So this industry is okay. fast paced. How do you stay up to date? Do you read, do you podcast? What are your go-to resources? Um, I'm definitely more of a reader than a podcast. Um, so I tend to uh, look for articles or people send me articles. Um, the other place I get a lot of uh, benefit from is the industry forums that are stood up. So that's where I actually get most of my data from. Okay, so do you have a favorite industry forum or a favorite periodical? Um, right now, I'm really loving the Digital 50, um, or the World 50 organization. So I'm getting a lot of networking out of that one. So um, I recommend it if you have an opportunity to join. It's been uh, very value added. Okay. Made a lot of good contacts, a lot of CDOs. Good, and when you're not working with data, what are you doing for fun or to disconnect? Uh, probably a whole lot of Netflix that I should be doing something else. <laughs> um, and I do, I do enjoy um, gardening, which for me is AKA pulling out weeds, uh, but I love it. I could spend hours, hours outside yanking out weeds. Yeah, it's I, so satisfying. <laughs> I'm more a weeder than a planter as well. My husband does the planting, yes. so we're on the same page there. I don't know. There must be something in the um, disposition, the analytics disposition there. I think so. Making order out of chaos. It's just so satisfying to see it all cleaned up. It's good. Yeah. And at the end of a hard day, if you need a, a pump me up song or type of music, what would that be? Uh, well, I am a major Pearl Jam fan. 
Um, so anything Pearl Jam related, I will probably throw on. It just picks up my mood um, instantly. So a big Pearl Jam fan. Okay, great. And then the last probably one. Probably dating myself. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, listen, I'll be talking Barry White, so I'm dating myself even more. But um, <laughs> if you, uh, so I'll let you choose this last question, either um, something that has recently just made you laugh out loud, tears running down your cheeks, or what are you most grateful for right now? Um, you know, I'll pick the latter one. Um, right now, what I'm grateful for is, uh, you know, the ability to spend a lot of time with my kids. With the pandemic, we were, um, I was really, uh, I was really spending a lot of time at work, you know, as we all are. And I have several kids in high school and I was thinking to myself, I'm missing so much of their, of their lives being at work and all of that kind of thing. And with the pandemic, it was such an opportunity to bond with them. And so I do treasure every moment. And last weekend I picked up my eldest from college. He's been away for a year and I'm just trying to spend as much time with him as possible. He probably doesn't know that, but that's what I've tried to do. So if he's wondering why I hover so much, that's probably why. Yeah, um, I feel like you blink and then they're all grown up. So I know Isn't this it? work from home has been hard for some, but a blessing for many. Yeah, no, I've found it to be a blessing in that in that perspective. Yeah, Pascal, thank you so much for being on the Data Chief. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been great. Thanks so much, Cindy.